Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of An Unexpected Podcast. My name is Tim, and with me as always, we have Matt, Mick, Rainier, and Devin. On this week's episode, we're going to go over a list, as always, and we'll move on to our topic of the week, which is what is a filthy list. And then finally, we're going to end up with a new sub, uh, topic that we're going to call the duel. Uh, so first off, we're going to start off with the list. So I'm going to move over to Mick. Uh, Mick, what, do you, what is the list for this week? Right, so this list was posted on uh, one of our previous videos. Uh, it's from Leon. Um, the list is Elrond mounted with armor. Oh yeah, this, uh, this by the way is for a 555 points list for an upcoming event. So once again, Elrond with, uh, on, on a horse with armor. 11 Knights of Rivendell with shields. One of them carries a banner. Then Círdan. And one high elf with spear and bow, which leaves six points left. And Leon just added that uh, his thought behind this, uh, this being uh, his list was that 555 points is ideal for Rangers of Athelion. So he wanted to have blinding light um, because that's going to be really useful here. And then he was asking also if he, we would prefer to take Mounted Legolas instead of Caradon. So my first thoughts here are, well, if you're going to, uh, to take blinding light because, because you're worried about uh, Athelion, why not just go bigger and take Galadriel, Lady of Light, um, who will additionally not only give you Blinding Light, but also give you uh, Strength 4, Fight by 6, uh, Heroic Striking uh, character, who also makes Elrond um, much, uh, uh, much better against Ring Raids and any other spell spellcasters, which you might be able to see at this point level. So my changes to that would be, I would have taken Elrond Mounted, uh, with no heavy armor because 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 the points just work out in that specific way, then I would have ten knights with shields, one of them carries a banner, and then have Galadriel, which in total ends up to twelve models, and five hundred fifty-five points, um, whereas the original list had fourteen models and five hundred forty-nine points. And so over to you guys. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I don't know because how 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 big is Curdan's blinding light? Six or twelve inches? Six inches. It's it's only six. Yeah, that's what that's it's, what I thought. It's, it's, it's twelve inch illumination for any scenarios which might be played in the dark. Uh, just make it okay. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I don't know how much that can actually cover in your original list. Uh, you have you said twelve cav and some infantry. Um, even if you came against the Rangers of Athelion list. I don't think, unless you're going to line up uh, two or three Cav and everyone behind them, I don't think that blinding light's actually going to help. I kind of like Mick's idea about bringing Gladriel because I feel like you need something that can kill a little better. Um, that said, um, one way you can work around sh shooting armies like Rangers of Athelion is bringing Heroic March into the list. And uh, Elrond doesn't have Heroic March, correct? No, he does not. No. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think so. so I'd consider either a Numenorean captain. Uh, he's fight five and bring in some Numenoreans, or bring in an even a high elf captain um, to get the heroic march. So you're not really scared of shooting. You can just 15 inches, um, maybe have one one Athelian volley in your face, and then the next turn you can actually come into combat and railroad through it. So that, that's just my suggestion. What do you guys think? I guess regarding Kierden, um, but so I did the suggestion behind blinding light. I actually really like. Um, my only fear about not having blinding light, as you said, even one volley from affiliate Rangers, it, it's so disgusting. It, it's lose half thirty half. shots. Yeah, <laughs> your army's done. Like it, it's game over. It won't even be a game. Um, so I don't think you can even take one volley from this. There is a question in my mind about whether or not this list functions at 555 points at all, or are we just trying to force a Rivendell Knight list at this points level? I think it, it could work. Um, now, you're, I'm going to answer one question you have before I respond to Rainier and stuff. You asked, would you prefer to take Legolas Mounted with armor and a cloak uh, instead of Kyrdin? Um, no. <laughs> I think it, it doesn't really accomplish the, uh, the, the march aspect doesn't really accomplish the blinding light. I'm not sure what you're really gaining from having Legolas in the list. You still already have board control with superior shots. Like, let's assume you didn't come up against a Athelian Ranger list. Um, however, now there's a big point to this, though. Let's say you don't come up against an Athelian Ranger list. You never do in the entire tournament. 
uh, I think Mick's original point of Galadriel is going to be more all comers than what Kierden will provide here. Because I think you'll give your knights potential terror, which is nice. Uh, you're kind of foot slogging to keep up, keep around him. And now you've confined yourself to this little bubble. Um, unless you channel, I guess, or dismay, in which case it branches out to 12 inches. So that's a thing I guess I can mention here. And I forgot, what was his other R of command? So nominally useful, I suppose. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I see the point behind Kierden, but the fact that he's going to be trailing behind the army and but the fact that he's going to be keeping you in a ball and the fact that once combat actually hits, he's not doing a whole hell of a lot for you. Um, I'm trying to think in my mind, I'm going to pass it off to Matt, but I, I, I might chime in later. I'm trying to think in my mind a mounted hero that will help just as much as, let's say, Legolas or something, uh, you know, because the fact that Kierden's not mounted kind of bothers me. I don't know. Matt, what do you think? So the answer to your question of who's the mounted hero that complements this list, the answer is Gandalf. But I think once you add Gandalf and Elrond into a 550-point list, you don't have any points left over to have an actual army. Um, the, the problem with Kierden in a list like this, and I... I had this problem recently in a game, which I'll go into in a second, um, comes when you have males from a battle deployment. Because he's got, he's got one guy he runs around with, and he's got one point of might. And uh, I, I just went through a game where I had Kyrdan as, as playing a Last Alliance uh, army, and I had Kyrdan in there. And we were playing um, Heirlooms of Ages Past. Kyrdan did not end up coming on until turn four. Um, and that was after having to burn his point of might to drop a two down to a one so he wouldn't come in. He's a guy that cannot show up in the wrong, cannot afford to show up in the wrong place because he'll die. And uh, you can end up in a situation where, you know, he comes on and Elrond has to burn all of his points of might to come on near Kyrdan. Uh, or if for some reason Kyrdan rolls the one on the first turn and he's not coming on, um, he could not come on and help. So in a, in, a, in a list like this, I think for the reasons previously stated and for Maelstrom Battle, he's not the guy that you want. Um, the solution I had was the exact same one that Mick had, which was you take out Kyrdan, another knight, and um, the armor if necessary to make the points work, and uh, you add in Galadriel, Lady of Light. And she solves two problems. Uh, she solves the blinding light issue. She also... Um, she comes with three points of might. So you have enough might with her to, so that she can make sure she comes on where she needs to in the Maelstrom of Battle scenario. Um, and uh, she also, you know, with her ability, you know, with her terror and her minus one, uh, if she has to, she can survive a turn on her own in Maelstrom of Battle before the knights show up to help her. Uh, and I think when you have her in this list, because, I mean, she's also moving six inches. She has a six-inch bubble, which, if you set it up right, is going to be more than enough space to cover all of your knights. Um, what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with your ten knights kind of shooting out of this blinding light bubble. And as long as the other side doesn't have blinding light, they're probably going to win most of the shooting engagements, because as long as they're stationary and Elrond is within six inches of them, which he should because he also wants to be within the blinding light bubble. They're re-rolling two hits. Uh, so they're doing an awful lot of damage on the shooting. And hopefully you, you, get the, you provoke the other guy into getting near you. Once he gets near you, then your knights, you, you, you wait for the, you use Elrond's uh, 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 foresight points to make sure you get the initiative you want, and then you get that charge in with the knights, and then hopefully you, you go from there. And I think that's the way this fights. But... I think Galadriel, Lady of Light, um, gives you the extra might. She gives you the ability to fortify Elrond, and she gives you the blinding light. I think she's the better choice, even if you have to decrease your model count. And it's still fear. Just just throwing that spell out there, because it's actually very powerful with her negative one. She does have instill fear that allows you to, if you go first, wreck a lot of things. Go ahead, Mick. Yeah, there's, there's uh, one final thing I, I'd add. Um, I guess you could also take Boromir on the horse instead, but that's if you wanted to really go YOLO and just go, okay, I don't care about Regis of Athelion, but I'm going to wreck everything else in combat, then you could just just, uh, just take Boromir. But uh, generally, I think I'd, I'd go with Galadriel. 
And remember, again, even against Rangers of Athelion, there's some scenarios where you're going to wreck them anyway. Like, you know, if you yeah. get contest of champions, then you know, you you pretty much got what you got what you need against Rangers of Athelion. I think um, the amateur might helps with her uh, moves as well. Just here throwing that out there. So I went ahead and I, I added up the uh, the cost. And so if you took uh, ten knights with shields, and you took Galadriel and um, Elrond. And I'll end, end I'll round with horse and armor. It's 540 points, so you're 15 points short. If he you had then, a banner. Yeah, yeah so, at that so, point, at that point uh, you dropped the heavy armor and other banner. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was just about to say, was yeah. if, you, if you dropped the heavy armor on Elrond, you could fit a banner in there. So you'd have yeah. Elrond on horse without armor. You'd have uh, 10 knights, one with a banner, and you'd have Lady of Light, you know, with Elrond also having terror. That's always a good thing that, you know, with the minus one around him, that's always a great thing that it's harder to charge uh, Elrond himself. And then, you know, you have the blinding light. Elrond's protected against magic due to the fact that, you know, you'll just um, fortify spirit him and yourself. So magic's not going to be as big of an issue. And, um, you know, then then you have 10 knights to shoot with blinding light. And I'll, it'll it'll definitely. I, I kind of agree with Nick on this, where it'll it'll just be really good to have someone like Lady of Light instead of Kieran. Tell us how you did uh, at the tournament, and hopefully you actually get to play a tournament because none of us do. Kind of these days. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, you have more combat experience than us <laughs> for the last three months. Anyway. <laughs> Yes. Uh, as always, leave your uh, lists in the comment section below. We'll try to review them if we're able to. Um, and uh, if you have any thoughts on uh, Leon's list, leave those as well. So maybe he could listen to those as well. Uh, we're going to move on to the topic for today, which is what is a filthy list? So I'll, basically, I want to ask you guys, what in your opinion defines a filthy list? Uh, so I'm going to start off with Mick on this one. Mick, what, what do you think is a filthy list? Oh. Uh, I would say such a thing doesn't exist. Like, <laughs> you heard it here, folks. That means every <laughs> list you take is no longer filthy. You could take what Damien No Burn says is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, we might have a really filthy list at the end of this 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 episode, but you're gonna have to watch until then. But generally, um, I think in 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 general, I would say uh, it sort of depends on. Um, your reason for going to a tournament or, or to any sort of event. If, let's say, I'm going to a tournament uh, in order to get challenged and in order to compete with uh, people who are trying to bring as powerful and challenging lists as possible, then I don't really care whether someone thinks their list or someone else's or, or my list is filthy because at the end of the day, my reason for going is to play very difficult, very challenging games. So I think it's, I don't know. Like I, I just don't feel like any list can really be like filthy in a in a in that specific way. So I want to actually frame this discussion a little bit because I think specifically this question refers to what if we were going to Throne of Skulls? All right, not supposed to be competitive. What would actually be called filthy? Because actually, I had this discussion with Damian O'Byrne um, over in the GBHL, and we were going to the first Throne of Skulls event after the new rules got released, and traditionally. It, you know, we, we would bring armies that are thematic to Lord of the Rings and those armies would suck, but they were thematic and that's what we were trying to do. But we ran into this conundrum where thematic lists actually are winning tournaments. They're actually pretty devastating. So what is the new metric for a filthy list? Even in Damien O'Byrne's attempt to bring two thematic lists to the Warhammer World GT, wasn't going to win wasn't trying to win. He was coming fourth place. <laughs> yeah, so he came fourth place with a, a, a ride out and meet them. They had into the list in a, and then the Isengard Legendary Legion, which at the time he didn't regard as as powerful as it was. So that's what I want to frame it around. Let's say you said a competitive tournament, Mick, but let's say you're going to a thematic tournament. Is there a point where the list is filthy? Well, I guess if I'm, if I'm going to a thematic tournament, then... Uh, I don't really care about about winning, so maybe, maybe, maybe there is a point. I mean, <laughs> I feel like if there is a play, I I would say there is a filthy player rather than a list because some people like if they just give you a really bad experience of the game, then no matter how themey their and and how beautiful their list might be, 
you still not gonna enjoy yourself. But so, if they if they're really nice and they crush your soul, well, at least they at least they were nice about it. So so one thing I want to throw out there, Mick, real quick, just just so I can kind of give you. Let's say let's say throwing a school. I don't know how many points throwing a schools normally is, but let's say it was five hundred points, and I it's decided it's thousand. Okay, but let, let's let's say for this purposes, it was a thematic tournament in general, and it happened to be five hundred points. I think we all know where this is going to go down. But let's say you someone took Rangers of Athelion. Now it's very themey. It is, but at that points limit, it's pretty filthy. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 does be. I guess my, my question to you is, with everything being more themed nowadays, is that list considered filthy just because of how good it is? Or because it's, it's very themey in the way that the list is built, can it not be considered filth because it is all just theme? It's so themey. <laughs> it's just so themey. I, I don't think they can be filthy. <laughs> so... Let me try and put an objective definition on a filthy list because I think it can be done. Um, so, and, and I want to, I want to kind of get beyond just a filthy list is a list that has a pejorative adjective in front of it. Um, I'm going to say that a filthy list is a list that takes advantage of situations where the, uh, where the effectiveness of the army is not properly reflected in the points. I think that's what makes a filthy list um, it, to, the, to the extent that we're all discussing, because that's really the problem, right? When somebody, when somebody gets to the point of trying to build a better mousetrap to the point where they find something in the rules that's a mismatch to the points and they take advantage of that. Um, and, yeah, and I mean, I think we all try and do that and that can happen regardless of theme. I think, Rangers of Athelion may be an example of that, where something has occurred uh, where, the, where at certain points levels, the points that you pay for that army do not reflect its effectiveness. And I think that was, that was the issue with the Iron Hills Ballista uh, for a while. I think that's also an issue with Goblin Town, um, because I think the, the goblins are, the goblins themselves uh, are worth more than their points are, and you get tons of them, so that, that aggregates over time. But I think that's the definition of a filthy list is you've got kind of a mismatch between how well the army fights and how much you're paying for it. And I'm kind of curious to see what other people think about that definition. Uh, I agree totally. Like that, that totally makes sense. I know we, we probably do when we go to Articon, you try to abuse the point system as much as possible. You try to find like Mac, like Matt said, a bigger mouse trap or like a secret weapon. Um, but for me, I feel like a filthy list. Yes, of course, you come ac across Goblin Town or Rangers at like 600 points and you're just like, oh, this is not going to be fun. But for me, a filthy list is something that has no weaknesses. Um, well, two, two things. One, if it has no weaknesses. So Rangers of Athelion obviously has a weakness. Like they crumble in combat. I know at 600 points, you're not going to be able to get into combat because they're going to shoot you. <laughs> at a but, but, um, for me, it's if it has no weakness. And a lot of that is what I like to call Franken-esque lists. And it, it's not that I don't respect the player, because I really respect the players who come up with these red alliances and they intermix. I feel like that's a huge art and a strategy of the game. But for me as a player, when I come across that, I'm, I'm, I feel like, oh, dang, like I don't, I'm here with my themed list, like like army and I don't want to see fight against something that like wouldn't make sense from the books or from the movies. So for me, that's what's filthy is um, something with well, two things. One thing that it, it doesn't make sense from the movies or the films or the, sorry, the movies or the films, the films or the books, or it just has no weaknesses to where it's not like the player you're playing against. You're playing against the list and not the player. If that makes sense. I, I want to push back at you on that as far as the list that has no weaknesses. And I want to push back on it on two fronts. First of all, I'm not, I'm not sure that such a creature exists, first of all. Um, you know, I think, I think any list you create is going to have a, have a weakness against something. I mean, there are armies that can decimate Goblin Town. There are armies that can decimate the Rangers of Affiliate. Um, but, but yet we still kind of consider them filthy. And I guess this, the second point I want to I, I push back on is it filthy, even it, assuming such a thing existed, 
would that be filthy or would that just be kind of the pinnacle of a list? I mean, if you had, if you had a list that had no, no weaknesses, but was, you know, kind of otherwise properly pointed, i.e. it had, it had no real weaknesses, but if you went heads up, heads up against another army um, of equivalent fights, it could be beaten just kind of on normal, on normal grounds, just by, you know, better play or better dice rolling or a combination of both. Um, yeah. Would that be filled? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't think it would be filthy. And I think we all agree that there are certain armies that need to be revamped point wise, Goblin Town um, being the primary one. But like, for me, I'm more talking about, say, the winner of Articom last year, he had a Spider Queen of Shade and the Goblin King with Gollum or something crazy like that. Like coming against that, I respect it as a list build, but I'm not really into it, if that makes sense. I don't really enjoy seeing it and I don't really enjoy playing against it. I don't really enjoy playing it myself. That's my, just might be me personally. I've got nothing against anyone else, but for me, that's what I consider filthy. That well, makes sense. Odd that both both Rangers Battalion and, and Goblin Town can just be run over by chariots, which Rainier you like playing so much. What? So I, I, I don't really see why you're complaining. <laughs> Everyone bring bring chariots to all your tournaments so you can balance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, you can, you yeah, can just I mean, run over the filthy list with chariots. <laughs> Unless the rangers are in the woods, in which case you're out of luck. <laughs> so if I uh, can hear Matt's definition, Matt, what was your definition that you gave you? And it was so... So my definition is a filthy list is any list where its effectiveness is not properly uh, accounted for in the points that you pay for it. Okay. So I, I think I think that's interesting because yeah I think the armies Goblin Town most specifically I I've so far haven't lost to it thankfully but it's it's a nightmare to play against uh, in my opinion I mean I know Mick also had some experiences lately where you you you've beaten it but I I think that would it's weird to call it filthy because it's like okay how else would you play it um, so it's almost like a failing in design. Uh, which is kind of what Matt was getting at with the points. Um, I think if I were to have to agree or disagree with that, I, I'd have to just disagree only in the sense that I think it's unfair to say the way that an army normally plays and can only be played. Because Rangers of Athelion, it's like you have realistically one way to play. I mean, I guess you could spam out Osgiliath veterans, but I mean, realistically, you have one way to play them. And so I, I think it's almost a, a failing design in the sense. And so then do we say you know, a list is filthy because it's so powerful. I actually know 40K does this. There's some lists in 40K where the army's just so disgusting, just in the way that it was designed, that people often discourage you to even bring that army. And I wonder if we're getting to that point where an army was designed too well in a certain direction, like Goblin Town numbers and then the shooting and the range of billion. As of right now, I hesitate to say that. I almost wonder if I agree more like with Rainier where it's more trying to get away from the intent of the rules in order to bastardize a list. I, I know at one tournament I brought to Desolation of Toronto, I brought um, King Alisar, Bormir the White Tower, and Elendil leading uh, Minas Tirith Warriors. And so themey. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, basically, you know, I have to say, if I had to, to judge whether or not that was themey, which by Matt's definition, not Femi, sorry, filthy. By Matt's definition, I don't think it would be. I don't know. Matt can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Or Goblin Town was filthy. I'd have to say my list was filthy. Um, even though Goblin Town is abusing units that have better points, bang for their buck, I guess you can say, points for what they're getting. Um, Matt, what do you think about that? So I, I, for me, Femi doesn't really come into it. Um, as far as, as filthy goes, I mean, if you're, I mean, the lists provide for red alliances and they penalize red alliances. So, I mean, I don't think we can say, well, your list is filthy because you took a red alliance. I mean, they're, they're explicitly allowed in the rules. Um, and you can take a red alliance or a what if that, that, you know, has and play a perfectly fun game against it. But I mean, what I'm hearing all of you guys saying about things like Goblin Town and Rangers of Athelion is I really don't want to, you know, I, I, I've played against them, I've beaten them, but I really don't want to play against them. Yeah. And 
that to me is what I'm hearing is what we're all kind of considering to be a filthy list. And I don't think that has anything to do with theme. I mean, it just has to do with whether or not, um, whether or not they have an advantage that kind of outruns their points. And I mean, I, and, and I don't want to make this kind of a, an implied criticism of GW or the people who make the rules. Um, you know, this is, this is something that pops up in any type of point driven miniatures game. They're always going to be some, especially one that is as complex as this one and has as many different variables as this one. There are always going to be situations where, uh, where something, something pops up that the points don't, where the points are not properly reflective of value. Um, and you just got to kind of continually adjust those over time. But I, I think you're right, Devin, we've had the creation of a couple lists that are perfectly historical um, that uh, have, you know, they, they, they give, they give somebody an inherent advantage and a lot of, in a lot of cir circumstances against certain opponents in certain scenarios, they're almost an auto win. And that's the type of thing where I, that's what makes a list filthy for me is, you know, I'm winning the game, not because of how I played this. I'm winning the game because I showed up with the right army. Yeah. The, the, the entire idea of, of the auto win is, is actually um, the thing I would, I would lean the most with. So let's say um, if you have an all hero force, then it auto wins in certain scenarios and then auto loses in other, in other scenarios. Are you going to call it filthy? Maybe. Um, it just it just sort of depends on on, on what scenarios you really, you really you really come up with. But then something like Rangers of Pavilion, yeah, it's amazing and almost unbeatable at let's say five hundred points. Well, I wouldn't say unbeatable, but like it's one of the most powerful factions at five hundred points. But then when you scale it to to eight hundred, no one really wants to play with it because at eight hundred, um, everyone will have some sort of defense from it, and uh, you're not able to abuse uh, the shooting as much. Because um, it just so happens out of 500 points, having 30 bows, no one else is going to have that many. At uh, something like 800, having 30 bows is not that big of a deal. Uh, one, one thing I want to uh, bring up real quick that Rainier had, had mentioned was, I know that we're talking about filthy as being more competitive or like auto wins kind of a thing. Is it a filthy list if, like Rainier said, where there's red alliances so, for example, it, when, when he mentioned the, the GT winner where he had a Shade, uh, Goblin Town, and um, what was the other thing, Rainier? Spider Queen. Spider Queen. So, so let's say that, obviously, that's a very good, it won a tournament, it, it's a very good list. But let's say it was a Red Alliance, but it's not the most optimal list. So let's say it's just a bunch of random factions just all thrown together. Is that still filth because it's not thematic, or is it... Is it still filth because it's it's a bunch of things that shouldn't belong together? I, I think I think it depends on who you're talking to. I know as we're all discussing this, this is the first time we see what we think, and and we all think something different. Um, and just to remind the viewers, we're not the list police where we're like, your list is horrible. We don't respect you. Don't come to our tournaments. I, I'm but, actually the list police. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you everything. Check everything Damien O'Brien Burn brings to a tournament is filthy. Look at his Garber's results. Like a list passport yeah. to Matt's tournaments, and he's <laughs> like, no, you I have a badge and everything. It's legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, but where were we? <laughs> <laughs> no, you were. You were talking about how. Basically, Tim brought up the question that Matt answered. I think we all answered, actually, um, which is essentially it, it's come down to it. What is more filthy? Is it a red alliance or is it a, a list that even when played pure at certain point levels, which Mick clarified, you know, what, which is more you know, filthy? If you know your opponent's going to have a miserable experience at 500 points dealing with Rangers of Athelion, is it filthier for you to bring that or for you to bring – a conglomeration of Spider Queen and all kinds of craziness in order to maximize potential in the rules. That was what Tim basically his question was. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it is intentions. Like, what is your intention of your list? Are you just here to go ham on everyone? Uh, competitive tournaments, albeit like that's totally allowed. But what were you going to say, Mick? No, I was going to say that if you if you looked at the list which I put together in I think the first episode of this of this of this thing of the series, of this podcast, um, there was a I think it was. Uh, Master of Lake Town, some Lake Town Warriors, and then four big heroes. That list 
was a Red Alliance. It was really abusing the fact of having four massive heroes backed up by, uh, by a lot of uh, w uh, warriors with 5-4. And the four big heroes sort of almost exceeded all of the power levels within, let's say, that, that, that one hero or like hard-hitting hero category that I could basically ignore all the other parts of that list and still be able to win with it because it was so strong in one category. In a, in a similar vein that, let's say, Rangers get to ignore everything else because of how well they shoot. Uh, Goblin Town gets to ignore everything else because of how many there are. So I suppose you could call a filthy list uh, something that just exceeds any sort of like, um, like it's sort of almost, uh, almost beyond scale on one thing to, uh, to the extent that the, the other things just don't matter. So it kind of like to you, it's like it neutralizes a bunch of different aspects of the game that, that do matter. So for example, like with Goblin Town, you know, if you take that at pretty much any points level, you know, bows, not that they don't matter, but they don't matter nearly as much and kind of neutralizes them or, or magic, you know, it, it's not as important anymore because, you know, you, you just got really like one big hero and then just a bunch of troops that you have to deal with. So it's not as important kind of a thing. So more along the lines of it neutralizes different things rather than is while being great at being like a horde, for example. So I, I guess we're at an impasse here. Sounds like uh, <laughs> sounds like we, we have two different factions here. Is whether whether or not is it the the pure list that just and and, that, and also yeah to clarify the same thing Matt said, which is you know I said a failing of design. Um, uh, I agree with Matt. It's impossible to make this game perfectly balanced. Like it, it just, unless you're a computer that can suddenly pump this out that I don't, there's, there's just no way it's going to happen. Like you to make this game perfectly balanced. And it's easy things to miss. I mean, if you think about it, Ranger of the Thillion, they have no great heroes. They're, they're weak as hell in combat. They should be by all rights, a, a fairly mediocre list. And then they come in and they just destroy people. And then Goblin Town just by, circumstance of the new rules now became a top list whereas before no one was touching them so it, it's it you know it's definitely difficult to even see that coming um and i doubt it, any amount of play testing that they might do internally would even discover these things when you have now you send it out to the world and now you have fifty thousand play testers <laughs> so but go ahead nick there was actually another thing i was thinking about where um let's say 10 years ago or so or like 10 12 years um, uh, in one of the previous editions of the games. Um, it, there was almost like a, a situation where everyone was looking for this like holy grail of a, of a, of a perfect list, where you had to have a, uh, a good leader, uh, ideally a wizard, to nullify your, your opponent's good leader. Then you had to have decent numbers and enough bows in order to bring down your opponent's decent numbers. So if you were able to combine all those things, then, then you had the perfect list, but it was it was almost impossible. You always you always had to drop something in, in one of those places. You but then, play Lake Town. I was yeah, just so, about to say. <laughs> like, I was like, I was like so, wizard, <laughs> big hero, bunch of bows, numbers. <laughs> what does that kind of remind me of? But then, as soon as Lake Town came out, it's like, well, that's the Holy Grail. <laughs> it's got everything. <laughs> <laughs> Which. By only natural circumstance, now I'm not going to make the argument of whether or not they should be defense three, <laughs> but we I mean, <laughs> Devin, do you not see the armor plate on one out of three models? That's clearly yeah, how. Did you see they have just as much armor as a Numenorian warrior from the <laughs> They're clearly as armored as Numenorians, of course. Guys, so you got to understand the strength of whisker ba wicker baskets. It, it's yeah. when you when you yeah. hold one of those up. <laughs> you could stop a ball rock with one of those things. Is the is the carriage of the heart that does, does the defense? <laughs> I mean, we all saw the scene in the movie. They all were so courageous that must have increased their defense a little bit. Yeah. Well, we we did all see the scene where they went and got armor out of the armory. So I'll I'll defend it on that ground. <laughs> Yo, Pat, oh, okay, yeah, that's true. They didn't get armor out of the armory. So, but yeah, no, I mean, yeah. So so then I guess the question becomes: Is is Lake Town? Filthy. I don't think it is, honestly. But I mean, is that is that it, filthy? It, it's list, interesting, you... though, that that we we've never meant we didn't mention Lake Town at all in this list be, or in the in this conversation, just because we've mentioned Goblin Town, we mentioned Rangers of Athelion, but based on the criteria which Mick just yeah. said, basically, it does fit that kind of like. I am far more afraid of Goblin Town than Lake Town. 
yeah. personally. Yeah, probably I, so. I mean, hands <laughs> down, far more afraid of goblins. Oh, no, I, 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 Rangers I wasn't budget. referring to, I, I just meant like based on what Mick was saying of what was kind of like. Oh, that, like that, the perfect list. Yeah. yeah, the perfect list. And then that I, I just think that that was kind of funny how if he was perfectly naming off exactly what Lake Town mm -hmm. was, but then Lake Town didn't make that discussion kind of a thing. It's so, just, I mean, I, I don't consider Lake Town to be a filthy list. And the reason I don't consider it to be a filthy list is I think it is by and large appropriately pointed. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it covers a lot of bases, but it doesn't cover a lot of bases in an unbeatable way. And somebody can just come in. I mean, somebody with a you know, somebody who's chosen to put more points into heroes can come and out hero it. Somebody who's um, you know put some points in, put more points into uh, archers or brings blinding light can out shoot it if they want to. I mean, somebody can you know, if you bring if you bring a ring wraith along um, or the witch king or something like that, you can out magic it. It can it can be beaten. It generally creates a list that doesn't have a lot of glaring weaknesses if you put it together right, but it's appropriately pointed so that it can, so that it can be beat. Um, so that's, that's why I don't put it in the filthy list category is because I think it is by and large appropriately pointed. Would you so consider case, it's not a, it? Oh, sorry. So, sorry. So uh, in that case, it's not a filthy list. It's the perfect list. It's like, it's like, it's like <laughs> a golden standard. And then, and then based on Lake Town, we should, we should rate all the other lists. Well, balance so, it always. So it's a, it's a, it's a perfect list in the sense that you can create it. Well, you can create it to have no weaknesses, with the exception, by the way, of mobility. I mean, that is actually Lake Town's um, problem: is it, it, it doesn't have cavalry. And those um, kids are also a major weakness. Yeah, I, I mean, it, and it com it comes with some some other weaknesses. So it's it it's not it's not an unbeatable list. It's not a. Um, perfect list I think because it does come with some um, some weaknesses that you have to work around but I think you know when you when you figure out how to play against it it is appropriately pointed it has a lot of advantages that come with Bard but Bard himself comes with weaknesses and Bard costs a lot especially if you you know kind of buy all the add-ons that go with Bard um, so it you know I think in the end it, it it kind of works out. I think it is a it is a good competitive list, but I don't think it's filthy because I don't think it comes with any advantages that you're not buying. So it's kind of like it, the list is um, it's just perfectly balanced, basically. Yeah, it's it, it, yeah. it's like that saying where it's not the great. What was it? It's, it's master of none, but oh, I can't think. Of Jack of all trades, master of none. Kind yeah, of kind of like that. Where where it, it's not really great at one thing but it's really solid at everything yeah and i think Ability. you know i think just to kind of like finalize this subject before we get into the duel um i mean basically it's really i guess up to the viewers at this point to decide like what do you i mean obviously we're at kind of an impasse here is it the red alliances and the abuse of what is the intention of the game or is it playing a list that you know is just going to stomp out 90 percent of your opponents barring someone having specifically your weakness in a specific scenario, um, just because you're you're paying for things that are maybe in Goblin Town's case underpriced, or in Athelian Rangers' case, just abusing a mechanic of the game um, that is hard to get around. So, uh, but yeah, I I, I think uh, that pretty much wraps it up because I don't think we're coming up to a conclusion here. If you came here for a conclusion, I'm sorry, we failed you. <laughs> so. The wrong place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I guess uh, next we'll go ahead and get into the duel, Tim, and uh, go ahead and take it away. All right, and welcome to the next discussion. Uh, this is going to be called our new series, where we're going to call it the duel. Please let us know in the comments section below if you like it. Basically, what's happened is I've asked two members to pick, decide on a 600-point list, and they will then be put up against three scenarios I gave them, but they don't know which scenario they'll be given as well as a board they're not aware of. So I will reveal the board and the scenario to them shortly. Basically, I've chosen three scenarios for them this week that they would have to pick from and decide a list on. So it'd be Storm the Camp, Capture and Control, and Hold Ground. And I gave them six boards that they could uh, possibly be on, and they will then choose, uh, they will then tell you how they'll go through it. Uh, as always, if you have any thoughts on the list, Please leave them in the comment section below. If you have your own list, leave those as well. 
So Matt will be facing off against Mick. I gave them a 600 point list as a as yeah. what they had to decide. Uh, so Matt and Mick, why don't you go ahead and tell us what your lists are first? All right. Cool. So uh, should I go first? All right. So my list is inspired by Damien O'Byrne, as well as one of our commentators uh, on one of the previous videos. Um, especially Damien and his and his and his special uh, articles on the Warhammer community side. So we've got Saruman on horse, fourteen Creebane, Sulodon on an armored horse, and one Serpent Rider. That's seventeen models and five hundred ninety-eight points. That's a All filthy right. list. That's so Disgusting. filthy. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> yeah, like it, it does so sound like something that would come out of Damien. I know he's probably one of the filthiest <laughs> players I've ever I've ever met. <laughs> so, um, given the scenarios that we had here, which were uh, command and control, hold ground, and storm the camp, I figured this was going to be a mobility based game, and where I wanted a, a decent number decent number of figures. So uh, I went with the uh, Riders of Theoden, and let's see if I can. Ooh, it's going to be a themed battle. It uh -oh. is indeed. <laughs> this <laughs> was unplanned, people. Unplanned. <laughs> All right. So I'm pulling the list up on the screen, so you should be able to see it here. Um, uh, leading the army is, of course, Theoden King. With him, he has three riders of Rohan and one Rohan Royal Guard with uh, Throwing Spear. <clears throat> After that uh, is, of course, the second person you always take in a Rohan list, which is Gambling. And with him is one Royal Guard with Throwing Spear and three riders of Rohan. Uh, After that is the third hero you always take in a Rohan list, which is Durnhelm, uh, along with three riders of Rohan and one Royal Guard with Spear. <clears throat> and then in this case, the fourth hero that I took was Darewine, Chief of the King's Knights, because I figured that that uh, the extra the extra um, the ability to heroic march and his ability to call a free heroic combat to get closer to Theoden was going to be pretty useful here. And he has one royal guard this time without throwing spear because I ran out of points and two riders of Rohan. So that is my list. Comes in at I believe nineteen models. Whoa. Such a massive, massive advantage num numerically. <laughs> All righty, yeah. So I, I clearly have the advantage in uh, the advantage in numbers. Yeah, and, and the advantage in bow fire. The advantage in bow fire, although <laughs> I, I need to roll really six about. harder to hit. <laughs> so, Zuladan and his poor serpent rider may end up the target of quite a bit of shooting. <laughs> they probably will. Yeah. All right, so what's the, what's the scenario? What's the layout? For the board? Okay, so I will now show you guys, uh, this is live reaction for everybody, of what the board is going to look like. It's entirely flat. Or forest. It's probably all forest. Like, it should be just a, a woodland. Okay. And okay. this will there be the go. board. Um, for anybody listening on the podcast, it, will, it is a Mordor board with a couple of uh, looks to be orc tents and a little bit of dead trees in the middle and orc tents on lava just to, orc just tents to on lava yeah <laughs> absolutely it's new it's that's, new technology <laughs> that's always where you want to pitch your camp is in the middle of an active lava field Absol absolutely what absolutely could possibly go wrong <laughs> i think what's and, important oh i was like important to note i think is the fact that this board is is not like a 3d design it's actually one of those flat mats so there's no yeah. hills or anything it's actually you know, we say a couple tents, but there I think there's like six of them. Plus, then you got giant cliffs and and uh, and then a wood woodland. So it's actually pretty packed and crowded. It is actually quite crowded. Yeah. So this board was one of the ones that uh, that was featured at Desolation of Stockport in the UK, uh, it was, which was a large, I think, 90 player GBHL event a couple of years ago. Alrighty. Um, and I just want everyone to know that's listening. So I informed them of the three scenarios. I then chose it. So this uh, was chosen several days ahead of time. So I'll now reveal that the scenario that they'll be going into is Storm the Camp. And I'll Ooh. just go over what, it is what the uh, rules are for Storm the Camp. So I'll roll a die to see who gets to deploy first. And they will pick one of the four corners. 
and that will be their side, and they're allowed to deploy up to 12 inches in that corner. Their opponent will then be in the other corner up to 12 inches. Uh, the game will end on 25% of your force being left. Uh, and then the scoring points are you get three points if your force managed to capture your opponent's camp. If your force managed to capture your opponent's camp and your camp is not captured, you instead score six victory points. You score one victory point for causing one or more wounds on the enemy leader. You get three if you kill. And you get one point if the enemy force is broken at the end of the game, and three if they're broken and you are not broken. There is a rule called special uh, the campsite. The campsites are deployment areas of the two armies. A campsite is captured if during the end phase of any turn, you have more models entirely within your opponent's campsite than they do. Should your model subsequently leave a captured campsite, it will no longer count as being captured. In order to keep an opponent's campsite captured, you will need to keep your models within your opponent's campsite. Models that are within their own campsite will defend it at all costs. Any model that is within its own campsite at the start of the turn will automatically pass any courage test that it is required to make for the remainder of that turn. So I want to get your guys' opinions. What do you think of the terrain piece in the scenario given the armies that you guys chose? Well, so I, first thing, I have a major advantage and you know, there's lava everywhere, so he can't really <laughs> like, walk almost anywhere on this board and I can just fly well, over if you fly, I mean, to be fair, he could have, you know, essentially fried chicken if you get too close to the lava. He could, he could. So that actually raises a good point, which is something you should do at the beginning of each game, which is have a discussion with your opponent as to how the different terrain is going to be treated. Um, <laughs> so how are we going to treat this lava, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fine for me to just, go, to just fly over it. <laughs> It, it could be a, um, a river for you if you if you wanted to play it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think a river is really yeah. it. <laughs> so obviously, in these type of boards, I always find the best suggestion is to be like, all right, the lava yeah. is totally ignored. Yeah, yeah so just, I think just ignore the lava. The lava. Um, otherwise, oh, yeah. I think we're going to have a, uh, a very boring game as I sit in one corner without lava and you sit in the other corner <laughs> and stare at each other. Um, the... Uh, the I assume that we're taking that the, the terrain piece somewhat in the middle of the board there with the trees on it. That's going to be woods. Is that your yeah? Reading? I would say so. And then everything else is just tents. So the question is, can we land on top of them, uh, or climb on top of them, or should we agree that no one can go on top? Uh, I, I would say it's pretty difficult to actually. Like cl cl climb on top of a tent like that and actually fight on top on top of it. So I would just say it's, it's impossible uh, on the top. Can't land on it. Um, yeah. What about the what about the the lumps of? There's two lumps of rock, one on either side of the board here, that um, could conceivably be called hills, but they have pretty. They're pretty steep. Pretty, yeah, they're they're pretty steep. So. Um, I mean, I, sh I think I think you should be able to actually make a jump test to to, to go up there with a with a cavalry model potentially. Climb, climb test, right? Oh, well, no, cavalry yeah. can't climb. Sorry. So you're no, you're saying climb, whether or not right. the so cavalry we'll can get up there? We'll say you got to yeah. have a jump test to get up there, and yeah. and I think for um. So and then there's kind of two shallower hills, one on kind of. We'll, we'll call it the northeast and southwest corners of the board, one of which has a tent sitting on top of it. Do we just want to say they're they're open or it, yeah, you sure. know, just for block cover? Okay. All right. So I think Yeah, I'm generally I'm generally quite open to to basically agreeing on on everything my opponent says in these situations. Unless unless it's really uh, something that's really disadvantageous. So that's fine, yeah. All right, sounds good. All right, so we we've got the terrain figured out here and we know we're doing storm the camp. Yes. Right, should we, should we roll a dice? I don't have a dice. Yeah, so... Uh, Tim, roll uh, a dice. Who goes first? Yep. Okay. Uh, Matt, you get to pick first. I get to pick first. All right, so... You pick the corner with the least lava in it. Yeah. And in, in, in case anybody's wondering, I didn't just pick Matt because he's American and we're against England right now. Um, just want to make sure that that's perfectly clear, you know. We don't want to favoritize, you know, the U.S. beating uh, <laughs> England. But uh, Matt, you better win this because there's a lot of Americans <laughs> watching who want to see you win. All right. So um, just to give uh, uh, folks playing at home um, the, uh, the the layout of this, as we discussed, there's a, there's six tents kind of scattered throughout here. 
one area of woods that's more or less in the center of the board um, and then a couple of odd hills scattered throughout. The different corners that I could choose here have one with a, one with a tent in it, uh, or at least right in front of it. Um, uh, a second one with a tent in it, uh, and then two, uh, two other corners, one with a big high lumpy rock <coughs> sitting in front of it, and the other with a shallow hill in front of it. I think what I want to do is I want to uh, pick the corner that has the tent with the hill on it, which as we're looking at this is the one that's uh, closest to the bottom of the screen. The sure. reason I want to do that is I want to, um, yeah, th that seems like a pretty good perch for Mick to uh, hide Saruman behind and then run out, cast a spell, run back, run out, cast a spell, run, run back. So I want to deny him that ability. Um, there is a tent kind of toward the other corner, but that's a little off to the side and, and kind of near the edge of the board. So that may be harder for him to maneuver around. So that's my thinking there. I'm going to, I'm going to take the corner that's in the, uh, the, that's closest to my edge of the board right here, or I'm sorry, closest to the bottom edge of the board is what I should say. Yeah, that makes sense. I wonder where Mick's going to deploy then. Well, I have to deploy on the other uh, <laughs> <in> the opposite <laughs> corner. <laughs> so I guess I'm just going to do that. Okay. Right. So Matt, tell us how you would kind of try to, based on knowing Mick's army and the objectives that I said earlier, what, what are your thoughts on how to get to his, get as many models to his side while protecting yours? All right. So I think what I do is, um, you know, obviously everything deploys in my 12 inch bubble. I'm probably going to leave. Fortunately, he did not bring Grima, who, which was my, my big fear. Um, if Grima was here, I'd have, I think a significant problem but Grima is not here. Um, so I think what I want to do is I want to take uh, my force and kind of move it up to the open area in the center of the board, which kind of has a tent on the left, a tent on the right, some woods in front, but um, the woods are not big enough to kind of block off. I still have two approach routes to go around, one to the left of the woods, one to the right of the woods. And I want to go up there. I want to see how Mick reacts and where he uh, commits folks. And uh, then I think what I first want to do if he, if his birds come out is I want to go and hunt some birds um, so that uh, uh, I can kill, I can basically take down his numbers so he can't sneak a few birds uh, past to get to my camp. And I'd, I'd also probably take maybe three or four riders of Rohan and leave them back um, uh, into a position where they could run to the camp if they need and maybe just kind of shoot birds as they come in. Even though I only need a six, it's still something. So I think I run to the middle and I see which way he goes, um, see where he commits Saruman. Saruman has kind of one tent to hide behind back there. I think even with an 18 inch range, I can, I can kind of stay out of range of his, um, of his compels. Uh, and see how Mick reacts, and then using my march with, uh, with gambling or day or wine, kind of march close up to the birds, and then using uh, the the plethora of might that I have available, use some heroic moves to charge into them. They're still infantry, so I'm still doubling my strikes against them, and uh, kill off some of the birds. Maybe use some heroic combat if I can get two guys in on one. To, uh, or a hero and a guy and on one bird, that should be enough to take a bird down. Kind of whittle down his bird numbers. And then uh, once I've done that, um, then I think I make my run to the camp with maybe a, a march with Gamlin kind of taking the whole kit and caboodle with me. I think that's the plan. All right, uh, I'll pose the same question to Mick. How would you deal with uh, his army and getting the most out of this game? Right, so if Matt's leaving about three or four riders back, and that means I have numerical advantage now in the middle, in the middle of the board. So I probably would be flying out with the birds and getting somewhere where I can, I can put them forward and, and protect Saruman in order to stop uh, Sorcerer's Blast. Because effectively, I would be trying to blast things into Matt's heroes. Because uh, then 
their heroes lose uh, lose their mounts without uh, the, the possibility of, of of resisting with uh, with their will points. And also, every time I uh, I successfully blast any model, that model gets dismounted and receives two strength three hits because of um, being thrown. So yeah, my my main weapon here is just to try and pick off as many sorcerer's blasts as I can in as many sort of sneaky places and avoid combat, combat for, for as long as I can. Um, the Cree Bane are only hit on sixes uh, from, uh, from bows, so uh, the Cree Bane are, really, are, not, are not exactly worried about bow fire, but they have to be used in a way to protect Saruman from getting hit and losing his horse. Because if Saruman loses his horse, then I'm, I'm in major trouble. Um, yeah, so it would really depend on, on how these sorcerer's blasts and, and, and bow uh, situations go. And then once combat starts, uh, Matt is an, uh, has a pretty good advantage in combat, but my Cree Bane are able to like sort of jump around and surround him. Uh, so there may be some sort of advantages that I may be able to get. Plus Suladan uh, gives everyone a banner reroll. So the Cree Bane are always rolling three dice uh, versus Matt two dies when he charges, um, unless unless of course he's within uh, the range of his own banner. So I think the fight is relatively even. Obviously, every time he wins combat, he'll be dealing a lot of damage to the Grievein, but they're all on four wounds, so they shouldn't necessarily die too quickly. Then Suladan has to do his things. Uh, he's pretty strong. He's got a hero strike as well. There's Saruman for supporting. So I think. My my general game plan is to be quite reactionary and try to pick up as many models as I can with with, with sorcerer's blast. If I manage to pick up, let's say five or six, then I should just be able to surround him with uh, with all the Grievein. But if I don't, then it might be it might be difficult. And then hopefully, if he breaks first, then anything that he left back in the camp might just start running away and I can just pot potentially sneak a Kree through, but it, I wouldn't it necessarily... actually won't. If I'm in the camp... Oh yeah, yeah that's true, that's true, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So I wouldn't necessarily be counting on sneaking much through, I would be trying to see if I can maybe break him and end the game that way. So Matt, what I want to ask you real quick is, do you feel like you're the one who has to come to him, or do you feel like with your bows he has to come to you? So I think I... I think I have, uh, I don't have to come to him, but I think he could just stay back, I could just stay back and we draw. I don't see a downside of coming out and getting within 24 inches of him because the Kribane, I mean, as he pointed out, the Kribane are hard to shoot, but Suladan and Saruman are not. And they're, the way this terrain looks, uh, there's no real, you know, it, he has to kind of hide uh, Suladan and Saruman. If he's going to hide Suladan and Saruman, he has to hide them kind of off to the side um, where they're going to be uh, difficult to intervene and I can just kind of go around the other side. So he has to kind of bring those guys out if he wants to come up within Sorceress Blast range or within range of Suladan support. He has to bring them out to some place where I can shoot him. And I think then I hover around 24 inches away. And if he's not sending Crabane down toward my camp, I'll bring out the other Rohan guys. Um, and I, I try and kill Suladan's horse and I try and kill Saruman's horse. Um, and if he ends up coming after me, then I try and go after those two models. Uh, and I think as long as, as long as the initiative works for me, um, I may be able to get into a position where I can do something like uh, um, getting, you know, a, either two heroes on a Crabane or a hero and a cavalry on a Crabane. Um, and uh, when I get that, um, then I can start calling either death or heroic combats and then hopefully get into Saruman or Suladan. But I think what I do is I, I plink away at him until he kind of commits close to me. And then I make my rush and try and do my heroic combat into his generals, into his heroes. It's actually quite a funny situation with, uh, with all the movement in that uh, we both have heroic marches. So if, let's say, I lose a priority role um, and do a march, 
I may be able to get myself within charging range next turn, and then win, and then winning a, a, a heroic move might, might allow me to charge, but then the same situation happens from that. So it will all really depend on where we're standing and how much forward or back we can be moving from those positions as well. Uh, Mick, I want to ask one last question, which is, who do you think has more staying power in combat itself? Well, Matt's got more heroes, so there is an advantage. But any time uh, a situation happens where, for example, a hero and a rider accidentally get into combat with a single crew bane, I can just blast the rider and dismount and wound the hero. So I'm not sure who's got more staying, more staying power, really. I think, I, think, I think the whole game will heavily depend on what happens with the magic. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go over to uh, Devin. Devin, what are your thoughts on the two armies and, and how you think each one could take advantage of the situation? Filthy. Yeah. Filthy. <laughs> <laughs> so this very thematic Creebane list that uh, <laughs> it's, actually, it's, actually, it's actually got a lot more uh, advantage than most people might think. I mean, it, it, it's definitely easier to take down than with... I know, like, so you got four wounds, sure. Uh, I do think... I think they're defense three. I do think in close yeah. combat against a cavalry model, they will go down fairly quickly. And if Matt plays his cards right, and let's say he throws, you know, it, it'll be like, I would be kind of still tempted to throw a, maybe a rider with a hero, like assuming, let's say Mick move first um, and then has to cast his magic. If I'm moving second as Matt, then I'll, I'll probably gang up on a single bird and then call her a combat and swing a couple riders towards Saruman to where he's like being, chased around um once saruman's out of the picture getting eliminating the kree bane becomes fairly straightforward uh so really the key is getting him out of the picture i guess you could probably send someone a little bigger maybe uh Durnhelm, i guess possibly i think they have the most will um but i mean that's just my thoughts i think ultimately uh, this game will probably favor Matt, but I'm not <laughs> sure that <laughs> Mick brought a, a list <laughs> intending to win a tournament. <laughs> um, so it, it is a funny list, especially with the inclusion of uh, with uh, so them. Another thing I like that Mick said, though, is um, there there is a way, and I've done this before, to abandon your camp entirely and still win the game and just let them take it over. And that's to really break them, kill their leader, and uh, kind of be in their camp. And you can do that. It's a shame Cree Bane don't count as like 10 models. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, ultimately that's, that's what I'm seeing. I mean, I'm seeing it as, yeah, Matt is in a very comfortable position. He just has to figure out how to apply pressure to Saruman because once that's happened, it becomes very difficult. However, if Mick does manage to dismount his critical heroes, then actually, depending on how much Kribane he has left, this could quickly go in <laughs> uh, Mick's favor. So, and he's got a very potent tool to do that with. So, yeah, I, I have to agree with Mick. I think it depends on the magic, but I don't think that Matt is going to allow that magic to punish him before he at least swings in. Uh, actually, you said you have 14 Creebane? 14, yeah. So, so 14 40 mil bases can definitely provide some blocking in this tight. Can definitely terrain. do it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, actually, that, that might be a little harder against what, 17 riders? I mean, that's the thing, like, um, at any time, Matt might not be able to shoot all of the 17 riders into Saruman. Let's say, at best, he'll probably be shooting, let's say, 10 or 12. Then, if I just stick to Kree Bane in, in front of him, then his, his, uh, the initial hits, let's say, are five. One maybe goes through, half of that goes, goes on Saruman's horse, and a third of that kills the, the horse. So, the, the odds are okay on my side. <laughs> It's not with the dense with the densely packed terrain. The fact that the terrain is so large, it's occupying a lot of space. It's creating it where only like one or two cavalry models can squeeze through these little gaps. Maybe yeah. a three in some areas. So it, with one single forty mil base, you can block a lot of area. Uh, so you know, as long as I mean, if Mick keeps moving second, especially <laughs> this can create uh, quite a conundrum. I, I mean, I think Mick definitely has a, a solid chance, but I'm. I'm going to bet, if I had to bet money on it, I'll have to bet on Matt as far as like how fast I do think he can take down these birds. But um, 
you know, I, I'm real interested to see how the Sorcerer's Blast play out too. So, but I'll go with Matt. Who knows? Maybe we'll play it out one day on a bat rep, and then I'll be like, I'll lose money. On it. <laughs> what do you think, Randy? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I, I feel like both armies are pretty equal. It's. It's a Theoden probably had a night. This is. This is like the army that Theoden had a nightmare about because he had to fight Soladin and Saruman. <laughs> Plus, he'd been up all night watching old Hitchcock movies. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Only. So only I, the I Witch King know. and five Nomarchs are missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know. I feel like. Uh, Either, either of you are one heroic combat away from winning the game. Um, just because there's so little models, like even Soladan, if he takes out four Riders of Rohan, like boom, there goes almost a, qu a quarter of your force. Yeah. So I, it's, it's quite hard. I think Saruman, the magic is really nice. Um, but I don't, I don't, what, the Kree go 12 inches or 10 inches? 12. 12. They fly. Okay. Yeah, see, that's one thing that none of y'all mentioned that I think is going to be a huge advantage to Mick. The houses, although you can't land on them, they block a ton, but you can always pop behind enemy lines or even have four Creebane go take the camp. And now he's committing four, four riders out to his camp because he doesn't wanna, want you to capture it. Not just that, but I also think, um, I don't know, I played Storm the Camp, I think, twice at a tournament, and it's very difficult. You know this when we played Devin. It's very difficult for us to take each other's camps, um, but not with these two armies. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. These two armies can easily do it. I guess, but, I guess, normal armies would be taking over the camp very easily, but, but in this case, yeah. Like, yeah. But, yeah. but I think um, the hero wound for the leader is a big deal, and I think Theoden's actually a little more finicky than Saruman because Saruman has three, what three fate, right? And Theoden has does he have one or two? There's one thing. One yeah, yeah. So that's kind of hard because he can have one bad roll or one one sorceress blast into Theoden and he's wounded. So I don't. It all. It's it's like a game of chess. Whoever takes out the rooks and the bishops first wins. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's so if you had to put money on it though, who, who you, if, I, uh, if I put money on it, oof. let me it's think. Not definitely tough. I think the list wise with com really good players, I'd go go for Mick. However. Knowing how technical Matt is with his miniatures, I think it's going to be really hard to get a get a sorcerer's blast. But I think I'd probably go fifty five percent towards Mick. Okay. We're casting a vote, Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> so the way we're going to decide breaking vote. Yeah. So the way we're going to decide this series is the three uh, people on the podcast who aren't actually involved in this game are going to decide it by doing a vote off to see who we think the armies would win. Uh, obviously, Devin has picked Matt and looks like Rainier is going towards Mick. Uh, I just want to ask real quick, what fight value are the Krabane? Um, one, one or two. Uh, lower. Yeah, uh, the very, I think, okay. I think it's they're lower. Yeah, they're, they're said, lower than like everything. You said, they had, you had, they had four wounds and um, you said they had two attacks? Yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask a question too? So Soladan, are they yellow lions or red? It's a yellow oh, eyes. Yeah. Okay, so they they could use his heroic march march as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, you can so, go like seventeen inches. You can, the yeah. You could That's what I was like saying that. earlier. Uh, that yeah. you could actually get into a situation where at the end of my turn I move seventeen and then charge. Yeah. Oh, there's and, no doubt about it that the the first engagement is all mixed decision. Like, but but even the terrain wise, like I see these woods and I see this rock, and just the cav can't get around if you just block it off. But the Krabane with the heroic, and that's kind of where I'm going 55 towards Mick. The Krabane can heroic march, and boom, you've got Krabane in your backside, and they're just uh, what's it called? They're trapping models and and kill. I don't I don't know, but I think I'm still. The, the, the other thing is, uh, he's only got six might in the army, so I'm perfectly happy to have him spend a might on heroic march. Whereas I'm going to be heroic marching. I'm going to be calling a heroic march like every turn. And I'm not. There you go. And Gr Grima's in the list too? No. Grima's not. No, no if Grima was oh, in the Grima's list, I'd vote Mick. <laughs> I'd vote Mick immediately. <laughs> <laughs> it, in fact, for those, for those of you watching out there, put Mick and uh, uh, um, Grima in your list in the, your version of this. <laughs> But then, okay, so if I was to take Grima, I'd have to drop a Kree and a Serpent Rider. So I would lose a model. 
I'm still going to go with Mick to see what Tim said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all the pressure's on me now. Um, Remember, so, Tim, don't betray your country. <laughs> all right, well, this has been fun. Uh, we want to welcome. <laughs> see you next week. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I got one last question, and, and then I'll get in. Um, uh, what strength are they, Nick? What? Uh, they are strength three, I'm pretty sure. Let me check. The Crabane? Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, they are strength two. Strength. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they're strength, strength two. two. So oh, I know. Yeah. I, so, so I'm actually killing on sixes on five. So that's yeah. Oh, that's so I think I think <laughs> because great. of that, I'm gonna have to. T if they were strength three, it would make it a lot. I think the fact that the Crabane need to wound on sixes on the guy. Regardless if he has the horse or not, obviously the horse will make a difference. But even if the guy, even if Nick decides to attack the horse itself, that he's going to need sixes on the warrior. No, no, um, no. He, it, he needs fives on the horse. He fives on the no, horse. No, no, but I'm saying, I'm saying if he decided to attack the horse itself instead of the warrior. But there is a lot of attacks just... that I have. Because if, uh, uh, if I manage to charge, I'm always rolling, uh, rolling three dice when I'm charging because, so because of some of them, effectively. Oh, well, no. Um, but, but I mean, just to, to actually wound. Let's say you win, yeah, yeah. you wound. That's what I was. So what, when I was saying that, I meant specifically when you're trying to kill him. Yeah. So he he's gonna need, and he, obviously if he he needs to wound you four times, that's a huge deal. And like you say, that the way that the board is set out, there's not a ton of space based on the little you know crevices here and there kind of a thing. Um, I I think the problem is is that. Oh, I don't know. The more I think about it, I kind of you have so you have Saruman with that you know compel, or you have the blast, or you have the the immobilize. I think I hate to say this. I, I think I'm going to go with before. On this one. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you say, oh, 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 you're already going with me. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Change my uh, mind, Nick. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to add that Saruman. Uh, just to just to reiterate, um, every time I blast someone. It's not a it's not a single strength three hit. It's actually two strength three hits. Yes. And and the same thing happens to every to every rider I might I might hit on the way. So, um, in in all these small places, like uh, we uh, we've talked a lot about these like small holes in between terrain pieces. Um, I should be able to get uh, one or two riders every time I blast. So it's two strength three hits on on each one of them. So there should be casualties coming. Yeah, I, there are going to be some, be some casualties, but I mean, it's the four heroes who that's what yeah have have will and have the might to make sure that they're going to make the tests. So you're taking on individual riders. And if I called death, I could quite easily kill eight Crabane on one turn, getting my four heroes in, mm -hmm. killing one of them, and then you know, killing one of them each, and then going into another one and killing another one. I think at that point I've killed enough birds that I can get at Saruman and. Suladan at that point. Well, I think for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and just go with Tim's original ruling because I can understand how hard this is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think, the, the, I think to just to end this up, I think I would ultimately just go with Mick, just because I think, like Rainier says, he has the ability to fly behind the lines. At the same time, you know, Saruman's a huge thing. Plus, you have Suladan to do some killing in there as well as how many serpent riders did you have? One. One, so you know he'll 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 be able to do something, and I, I think just barely. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, this this this, this is I, I, this is all really hard because I think with your the heroes you have, that's such a huge advantage to be able to call heroic you know combats or like you said, um, all you know with the hero advantage. But I think I just have to very very slightly like fifty one forty nine as Rainier will put it fifty five. I think I'll go fifty one to to Mick. So Mick, you I think you win this episode. Yay. No. Go, go Britain. Rigged match. <laughs> Give us back our country. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess that'll be it for this podcast. All right. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in for this week. Uh, if you have any thoughts of lists that you'd like to submit to us for us to review, please leave those in the comment section below. If you have any ideas that you'd like us to go on for future episodes, leave that as well. And we hope you have a good day.